Peter Charles here, Folk to Life Fly Fishing, and today let's have a little chat about spay casting fashion statements and how that affects our ability to both cast and fish efficiently. Because really, using the right tool for the job, for the, the river conditions you're facing, for the fishing conditions you're facing, is part of efficiency. So if you're using an inappropriate tool for the job, too big a rod, too short a rod, too long a line, too short a line, whatever it is, you end up not fishing effectively and you're probably not casting all that effectively either because you're having to compensate for the fact that this isn't the right tool for the job. And a big part of this uh, issue of using the wrong tool for the job comes from the fact that we're very fashion oriented in this business. I mean, I got into uh, single hand spay casting in the mid 90s and all I used was uh, regular trout lines. And I, 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 I'm, I'm, I say I'm spay casting. I was kind of using a modified um, roll cast, which was sort of like a single spay. And I'd use the Belgian oval cast too. So I, that was basically how I started with regular trout lines. And then in the late 90s, I got into, uh, you know, two handers with. Uh, either double taper salmon double taper lines or I would repurpose heavy um, single hand lines like 10 weights uh, and 9 weights and 10 weights and I'd put those on lighter uh, two handers and that worked out okay for my fishing. I'll put up a picture of a fish that was taken on a, a 9 weight head start line with uh, a poly leader and uh, it was on a, a 12 foot 6, 6, 7 rod uh, and um, it was a short cast, maybe 40 feet. So, you know, I was fishing 18 mile. That fish was on 18 mile in upper uh, western New York. Uh, I would fish the Cataraugus, uh, Old Orchard as well, uh, the Credit River, uh, Broady Creek uh, in Ontario. These are not big waterways. Uh, and you, you didn't need to get out there with a 15 foot rod and 85 foot long belly to cover the run. So the short rod, the short line, that all worked beautifully. Now, when I started going, I went into a, uh, the uh, local tackle shop looking for uh, something else. I don't even think I was looking for a line. I was looking for something else. The guy behind the counter said, oh, you got to get a wind cutter. You know, they're the best line, blah, 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 blah. So he talked me into buying a wind cutter. Well, the wind cutter was a good line for the Grand River, except I wasn't fishing the Grand River. It was way too much line for where I was fishing, and its turnover wasn't nearly adequate enough for the flies and the polyleaders and everything else. So I ended up with a line that didn't match my rod and my fishing conditions. And what was annoying about this is at the time when you got on the, the, the uh, various online forums, it was all wind cutter, wind cutter, wind cutter, wind cutter, wind cutter, wind cutter. I mean, it's a great line. No, I'm not knocking the line at all, but it was just so oversold in terms of its capabilities and where you should be using it. So I wasted what, 100 bucks, whatever it cost me, buying a line that didn't match my fishing conditions at all. And uh, about the same time, people started using uh, purpose-made Skagit heads, the, beer, the old beer can taper Skagit heads. And they were full lines. They had the uh, running line attached. Previous to that, uh, anglers out west had been hacking up level lines to turn them into scadger heads. Uh, but, you know, now they got purpose-built ones. And they were just, you know, level line, I don't know, 30, 35 foot long. And you hooked a sink tip at the end of it. And everybody went nuts on You got to have a scadget head. All of a sudden, the wind cutter was no good. You got to have a scadget head. And I remember the, one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen on an online forum was one guy in Norway had bought an American rod. So he wanted a recommendation of what was a good line to put on that rod. And everybody went, oh, you got to put a Skagit head on there. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy's in Norway. There's probably not a single person in Norway using a Skagit head at that time. We probably would about 2003 or 2004. And uh, nobody knows the, the style of casting. Nobody knows it even supposed to be used with sink tips. This guy would have spent a fortune getting an American... Skagit head sent to Norway and play, paid the VAT on it and the shipping and the customs duties. That thing would have been more than double the price by the time it's landed and it would have ended up with 30 feet of level line. That would have been really useful, wouldn't it? So, I mean, 
a lot of this uh, type of recommendations, it's just based on fashion. You know, you got to have a Skagit head. Nowadays, you got to have the super short Skagit heads. And we went through the switch rod phase. I mean, switch rods are not new. I've got a picture in a book upstairs of Arthur Woods uh, using a rod that we would call a, a switch rod in 1923. Uh, in the mid nineties, uh, uh, you could buy, um, a two, uh, sorry, a single hander from the UK, a 10 foot or 11 foot single hander, and you could screw in the bottom handle. I mean, it's an old concept. We just gave it, you know, the, the name switch rod was new, but all of a sudden, boom, everybody had to fish a switch rod. Well, my local river has huge wide runs and somebody out there, you can see people out there today with little switch rods, little short heads, casting 50 feet, covering less than half the run. And the fish could be scattered throughout the entire run because the river bottom is flat. So they could be anywhere in there, there in that uh, run. And, um, you know, they're covering less than half of it. And somebody talked them into a switch rod, and somebody talked them into a short Skagit head, and they're out there. They think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but they have no experience with anything else. Because, you know, you talk to anybody in the shop, switch rod, ultra short Skagit head, you know, off you go. The right rod, for those runs is a 15 foot 10, 11, all right. With like a, a short head or a mid head, uh, spay line. Uh, that's what you're going to do the best, get the best results out of because you can cover the run and cover the entire run. Uh, you know, and I've picked uh, fish off with casts that are 110, 120 feet <clears throat> because there'd be a pocket or a ridge or something way out there that I know exists and I can touch it with that, that rod. You can't get close to it with a switch rod. So a lot of the statements we see online about, oh, you need this or you need that, come from somebody who has no experience with anything else. All they've got, they like this, they've got a rig, they like it, they enjoy fishing it, which is cool. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, they they don't know the other person's scenario. They don't know the river he's fishing. It doesn't know their conditions. And they're recommending something that may be totally inappropriate. And the person who runs out and buys it and gets out in the river, they have a great time, they enjoy themselves, but they're not using the right tool. So they're working, often working too hard is what the thing I usually see. They're thrashing like mad to get that extra 10 foot of distance to cover a run when they could be just using a longer rod and casting further with a whole lot less effort and a lot more efficiency. So the bottom line with this little rant of mine is if you're going to make a recommendation, ask questions first about what, how the other person likes to fish before you make the recommendation. And if you're asking for recommendations, ask the other person what else they've tried, what, are the, what rivers they fish, what are their conditions like. Get some idea. Don't jump on the fashion bandwagon because you can end up spending a lot of money uh, and you see it all the time, people buying line after line after line at rod and they're just cycling and churning stuff's going on in the great auction house in the f sky. Uh, I, I remember that back in the uh, early 2000s, the wind cutter with, uh, I can't remember the rod, but there was one rod that was the big fashion statement back then. And about a year later, you'd go on the auction sites and there were all these rods with the lines all being sold together. <sighs> you know, it's, it's inevitable when you see the fashion statements. About a year later, you see them starting to appear for sale. People are getting rid of them. So we waste a lot of money churning gear to get something that doesn't work for our conditions because we bought it because it was the fashion. And all I'm saying is be aware that a lot of the recommendations are just fashion statements. And you know, when you're going out to buy something, make sure it's appropriate for your local conditions and you'll enjoy fishing it. Those are the two things that go together. You want to have it right for the fishing conditions and you want to be able to enjoy fishing it. And if you've got those two things working, you're good to go. So keep that in mind. Just don't go running off to the store to be, buy the latest fashion. Uh, it's often not the, the right ticket for your fishing. So keep that in mind. Cheers.